We'd like to welcome all of you. I'm Jack Cooney. This is John Yunsa. Thank you for taking the time to come. I'd like to start out by giving you a little bit of context to why we put out this latest announcement. When we came out in June, we said that the downgrade that we put out was because of weather in the United States. That is true. It was the worst winter we'd had in 125 years. Now, as weather has got back to normal, and you know from over here, normal does not mean no rain, it just means less rain. <laughs> Business is wonderful. All of our customers have strong backlogs for this year and into next year. The construction forecasts are all very, very good for the United States. So we see the U.S. as doing exactly what we thought they would do when we put out the announcement in June. The reason we put out the announcement showing a spread in sales from 83 to 87 was because of what we've seen in the last two months and a little bit of what we saw in June. There are three regions that we are concerned about. And that starts with Europe. And when I say concerned, in all three of these cases, what I mean by that is construction is good everywhere in the world. When we're talking to our customers, they have lots of business. They have a desire to buy machines. We anecdotally measure the traffic or the discussions we have with our customers. We know when there's lots of volume and they're calling about different machines for different jobs. So we have a very good sense of activity. Inactivity is fine. What we've got in Europe is Germany had a negative GDP in the second quarter. They had a manufacturing index that came out for last month that was not positive anymore. What we've seen from our customers is we've got lots of work. Construction forecast for Germany for next year is it's going to be up 2%. So this is a real problem for us. We've never seen any kind of drop in sales when all the construction forecasts are positive. So we're, we're sitting there trying to say what in the world's going on. And as we start to talk to the customers, we find out that they just have a concern of whether they should make a major investment at this point in time. Not that they don't have a need for it, not that there isn't backlog and work, they're just uncertain. And we all have an interpretation for uncertain. Mine is, there's a lot of crazy things going on where we're all living right now. And, you know, yours is less concerning to us than, than his, his twin brother, which we have over there. Um, but, you know, we understand what nervousness means. <laughs> and, 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 but in, in all seriousness, we, we can understand what people are saying. That is, that is Germany, and for us, that is the one that sticks out in Europe. We see that in other regions to maybe a little less degree. And there is uncertainty, there is hesitation, and we're trying to figure out what that means over these final four months. The second region is the Middle East. You saw in the forecast, they're down a million dollars from last year. The Middle East is small and it has been lumpy. I mean, a million dollars is two large line machines. And it's not unusual for them to have lumpy periods. But we're also seeing them having similar hesitations. Uh, we had a customer in Turkey recently that was all ready to transfer money for a machine had a major shooting in the area he lived in, and he said, you know, why don't we hold off a little while here? You know, get back to me. Okay. Third region is Australia. Their construction and their economy is doing great. Their reason is completely different. The American dollar is strong. The Australian dollar is the weakest it's been in a long, long time. What we know from our customers in Australia 
is that when their dollar, the Australian dollar, starts to weaken, it gets to a certain point where they just delay some of their major purchases because they know it's going to reverse and come out. So we have those three areas of concern, and we're trying to figure out when we sit in front of this group, what do we say? Do we sit here and tell you, oh, no problem, we're going to make 87, we don't have any concerns at all. Well, from what I just told you, you know we couldn't do that. Do we then say to you, oh, okay, these concerns are so guaranteed that there's no way we're going to make 87 and we're going to end up at 83? From what I just said, we can't say that either, right? And I think if you've interpreted what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we are not sure where it's going to end up for the reasons that I've just said, because we've never seen this before. In all of the changes, the, the downturns we had before, there was enormous clarity with what was going on economically to what was impacting our sales. So at this particular time, we're very focused on getting to the 87 million. We have a confidence level that we think we can make that happen. But we also wanted to be transparent and tell you, here's where we're going, but here's what we're thinking. Now, we've never done that before. We've always put one number out there and stuck to it. But this time was different. The one other final thing I want to tell you about the U.S. is you've all seen the information on the sky screen, and the sky screen is doing very, very well. And we're, John will give you some more details, but uh, we're excited about where we are. We're excited about our forecast for the year. And uh, it's going to be, a, it's a new, completely new market. It's new customers. Uh, people in that market have never seen laser screening before. There's a, a lot of good opportunities going forward. Can, can I just check? Am I right in recollecting that so far you've only sold one Sky? That's screen? correct. Yeah. Yes, we've only sold one. Wait, you, I'm taking his talk. Go ahead. Uh, sure, sure. So we, we've sold one. Uh, we, we set our expectations for this year were to sell a, about a million. So that's about five or six machines. Um, you know, the first half for us was, um, you know, I guess a period of significant progress because it's a new product. It's a disruptive product. Changes the way workflows have to be organized in these high-rise job sites. You know, we knew there would be a significant amount of learning uh, as we launched the product. So we had an intentionally measured approach to it. And really, we came out of the first half with, with three things. You know, first, we, we really stress-tested the machine performance. We made some modest uh, tweaks to, the, to our design, mostly on the software side, the control system. So we know the machine is performing where we want it to perform, at the level we want it to perform. Um, the second thing is we had a tremendous amount of learning about the job site environment and understanding all the coordination that's required from the different stakeholders on these job sites, cranes, crane operators, electricians, plumbers, the flat work uh, guys who are our customers, uh, the, the building uh, design engineers who have to basically specify the shoring systems for the floors. So we, we know the coordination that's required and we learned a lot about how to do that efficiently and more effectively on the front end. So that was a very important learning. And then the last thing, which is the most important thing for us, is we really validated the value proposition. So we know the machine delivers the productivity and the value to our customers that, that more than justifies uh, the selling price. So we kind of Progress in this case is measured beyond sales. It's measured in terms of our confidence as we enter the second half with a, a really deep pipeline of opportunities and, and we know the machine is where, where we want it to be. Okay, so just uh, to jump off from, from Jack's uh, kind of overview. So the highlights for 2019, um, you know, Jack talked a lot about the, the revenue expectations and, and a little bit about the market conditions. Um, you know, one of the things I want to point out is is the first half um, really does reflect or highlight the flexibility of our operating model, which allows us to to quickly adjust our costs to the demand for our products. So that's one of the benefits of having a, a high variable cost basis uh, business. So roughly 75 percent, slightly more than that, of our costs are variable costs, and of that, in really two sort of buckets. The two biggest parts are product costs, which are directly tied to volume uh, and material costs specifically within that, and people, people and people-related expenses. So that's, that creates a lot of flexibility to adjust our, our 
business to whatever level of demand there is. Um, so, and we were able to rein in some of our costs, uh, you know, particularly on the operational side to, to better line up with our demand levels. Um, and we did that, which re resulted in a reduction of SG&A period over period. But also we were able to balance that by also making investments in some of the key personnel we need to grow the business long term, uh, specifically the SkyScreen business and more investment in our product development team. So we're you know, making long-term investments while managing our cost structure relative to our, our core legacy business. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the SkyScreen and, and you know, we feel really good with the progress we made in the first six months on that product. Um, the long-term investments we're making beyond additions of personnel, we are proceeding with our expansion of our Houghton, Michigan facility to basically accommodate the new products that we have uh, that we're going to be producing, this, the family of products related to the SkyScreen and the high-rise residential. Um, so that project is about $3.5 million in CapEx spend, primarily second half. Um, in addition, we're also doing an expansion of our, our, clean, our classroom training uh, center in Fort Myers. That's about a half a million dollars. Also a second half, probably into Q1 next year uh, project. So between the two, that's about $4 million in, in CapEx that we think is an important strategic investment to, to support growth of the business going forward. Um, and then lastly, uh, the dividend. We, we did increase the interim dividend by about 5% to 5.75 cents per share. Uh, that'll be payable October 17th. It's a slight increase uh, over last year. An attempt to better balance, again, uh, create a little more balance between interim and final. Just as a reminder, our dividend policy remains unchanged. We have a fixed payout ratio of 50% of adjusted earnings. Uh, and we also still have our supplemental dividend policy, which calls for distribution of excess cash over $15 million at a 50% rate. So 50% of the excess cash over $15 million at year end is paid in the form of a supplemental dividend in, uh, in concert with the final ordinary dividend for the previous year. Um, so that's reflective of just overall the confidence and the outlook of the business. You know, the financial metrics remain strong. We believe we have healthy activity and or our outlook for the second half is, is a good one. So why do you use $15 million as your, as your, as your cap, if you like? Sure. So we, we, you know, we've gone through a number of different models and analysis, and, and we've determined that $15 million is a very uh, conservative, sensible cash reserve to maintain for a cyclical business. So we basically want to maintain a, a cash position, you know, that we determine based on our sort of diversity and, and uh, diversification and, and the business operations, that that's the kind of level of cash that we're comfortable with in any economic condition. And we determined that about two years ago, uh, and we're, we're continuing with that level. Um, so jumping on to slide three, a little bit on the sales by territory. Um, Jack, Jack spoke um, a good bit about North America. I think that the important thing in North America for us is that you know, the activity level has remained strong through the entire course of the year. Obviously, the rainfall was the big issue that we highlighted in our June trading update, that we saw concerns over the weather, which was impacting conversion of that activity into trading for us. You know, as we see the weather improvements occurring in the U.S., we're seeing the trading activity uh, kind of revert to normal levels for what we would expect. Um, therefore, we have a very positive outlook in North America in the second half, a much stronger second half versus first. Um, and we're, you know, feeling very confident about that. Europe, Jack spoke about, you know, that that's highlighting a little bit of a disconnect between the underlying activity, uh, you know, construction activity in the different markets with trading. And that relates specifically to some of the uncertainty that we're seeing with our customers. Um, a big contributor to the shortfall period over period, half one, uh, 18 versus 19, uh, is Germany. Germany was a, a big contributor in 18. Obviously, that's an example of some of the uncertainty. There's positive activity in Germany, but we're not seeing the trading come through. So that's just a, an area of concern for us in the second half, as Jack outlined. Um, China was flat performance period over period, and there's really three things to highlight on China. First is we're really pleased with the progress we've made with our national sales director, who has been with us for about a year. Um, He's, an experienced, uh, he's experienced in the construction industry as well as in the capital <coughs> equipment uh, industry or sales. And he's provided the kind of stable, very in touch with the China market uh, leadership that we need on the ground every day, 
that comes from being a Chinese national. So we feel really pleased with the impact he's had on our business. The flip side of the coin in China is that we are experiencing pressure on margins that come from the China-US tariff situation, where there's been a series of escalations and in some cases de-escalations that have been, it's been quite volatile, but in effect, what we've been doing is to absorb the impact of that tariff situation to create price stability in the marketplace for our customers. Um, it's something that's not impacted volume, but it's impacted margins, and it's something that we are going to monitor going forward as we don't quite have visibility into where all this ends. Um, the third thing in China, probably perhaps the, the most important thing, is, is you know, the demand for and acceptance of quality floors from building owners and end users remains to be the gating factor to getting meaningful penetration in the China market. You know, we have not seen that take hold. It's, it's happened at a much slower pace than we ever expected. But ultimately, it's that demand for quality from the building owners and end users, which basically allows us to fully realize our, our selling and value proposition in that market. And until we get there, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, limited in terms of our ability to penetrate the market, in our view. Um, in the West, there are numerous uh, trade conferences for your clients at which you can present the advantages of your equipment. Mm -hmm. Is it similar in China? Are, are there conferences where you can get your message out? Yes, absolutely. So a, a big part, when we talk about market development efforts in an emerging market, that effort is geared towards um, sort of preaching the benefits of wide placement, flat, flat level floors to architects, design firms, building owners, and users, um, you know, our contractors as well, customers. And there is a general acceptance that that's where the market is headed. Um, but we've yet to see it be translated into demand and enforcement of those standards on, on um, building, building floor le levelness, flatness standards. So it's, it's, clearly, uh, it's clearly an opportunity, but it's, it's been slow to realize. And at this point, quality really has been driven by US multi or Western multinational firms coming into China demanding a particular floor quality, as opposed to the domestic developers in China. And until the domestic developers really start adopting and demanding quality, it will limit us. When you're talking to your man in China, how, how much of a feel do you get for competition that's building up there? Because presumably you won't have it all to yourselves. And I hate to say it, but we always expect in China somebody will be copying what you're doing already. So. And, and they do. Uh, so Ch China, one way we look at the market is there's, there's two market segments. You have the productivity market segment, and then you have the quality market segment. The characteristics of each, the, the productivity market segment is, is geared towards customers who are looking to eliminate labor, and they really don't care about the quality of the product, the output, the floor. And therefore, they are more price sensitive. Um, they are not necessarily interested in learning best practices. So that's a particular market segment that we don't go after. The quality segment, which is consistent with us, our typical customers across the globe, is focused on delivering a quality floor as well as the productivity and uh, labor savings. And um, most of the knockoff kind of competition copies that you see are geared towards that low end price sensitive market. We're not chasing that business. It's out there. It hasn't really changed in terms of number. Um, and you know, it's no, we're no different than any Western company in China where you see that pressure. Um, the impact on our business has been to provide a, a pricing reference point for our equipment. So that does ultimately limit our pricing power in the market because customers can see on a relative basis, you know, a knockoff machine costs this, even though the Samuro machine is different, you know, it has a premium of this. It, it does somewhat limit the, you know, the pricing power that we have. But other than that, it's, it's just basically uh, in a market where we're not that interested. And you, you, you have any idea of the amount of the market in the good quality end? You know, what percentage you're getting? Because we see so much going up in China. We think, gosh, there must be a huge market. It, it's, we, we control that market, similar to where, where in the rest of the world. I mean, if, if a uh, Western firm comes in, wants a particular floor, you know, a, a Costco or, uh, <laughs> you know, a Western multinational, it's going to be one, one of our customers using our equipment. So it's, it's, it's just uh, that particular market segment has been slower to grow than we expected. So um, 
kind of moving on, Jack, Jack spoke to a good deal about the Middle East. Um, you know, Latin America, again, we had uh, a small base of, of revenue there, but we do expect to see some good opportunity in Latin America, mostly from uh, Mexico, Central America, we had some activity in Peru uh, in the first half. Um, Brazil has yet to come back online, but obviously that is the biggest economy there. So until that happens, Latin America will be somewhat uh, limited in its its potential. Um, rest of the world, you know, as the other side of, of things to the Australia concern is the, the uh, sort of, we're pleased with the performance of the India market where we have seen good growth. And it, it kind of highlights the difference between India and China where India, there has been a faster embracing of quality than we've experienced in China. And that actually plays very well into our, our value proposition. And we feel very pleased with the progress we're making uh, in India. How big is Indian revenue? So India, we don't separately report it, but one, one way to think about it is, um, you know, the percentage growth has been good. Uh, obviously, it's still a small base of revenue. We look at markets in stages. So you have kind of the first stage is to get to a million dollars. You know, that sort of says, okay, we have a, a good market here. Next phase is to get to three. When you get to three million, then you start thinking about infrastructure, you know, putting a, a facility in place, a training capabilities, et cetera. You know, we're on our way to three. Uh, and we like the progress we're making. Uh, jumping to slide four, sales by product. Um, you know, I, I guess the most important thing to highlight here is that there aren't any discernible trends in terms of take rates or shifts in take rates across the product families. You know, one of the benefits of having dominant market position is that we set pricing such that our margins are consistent across our portfolio, and we're basically agnostic as to take, take rates of one product versus another. Um, and generally, product take rates, you know, whether it's ride-on screeds, boom screeds, et cetera, are dictated by the types of project activity in the market. So there may be, in one period, uh, larger projects, larger placements. Another period may be smaller placements. It just, there's normal, normal ebbs and flows that we would experience. And this, this period was really no different in our view. But the overall comparisons to prior period were, were, were significantly impacted by the weather issues in the U.S. in particular. Um, and a little bit of the, the European um, shortfall versus prior year. So that's basically the, the, the overall theme there. Um, a couple of other points to highlight uh, are, are um, SP16, where we showed some growth versus prior year. Um, that, that reflects the, the positive impact of the Line Dragon acquisition, which occurred at the beginning of the year in January. Um, obviously, that product line was also impacted by weather. It's today very much a US-centric product. So the weather issues in the US impacted that and hampered sales of, of the SP16. Um, we do expect improvement in the second half. Um, reasons being, as the weather improves, that, that naturally in increases our opportunity. But we're also uh, releasing the converged next-gen version of the SP16 Line Dragon model that we know certain customers have been waiting for. So that's to be released uh, basically at the end of this, this quarter. Uh, by the end of this quarter. So we, we feel very confident in the impact of that. Um, as I understand it, the, the ride-on screeds are a cheaper product than the boomed screeds. Correct. Um, but I see that uh, the, the sales of those are reduced by more than of the more expensive product, uh, which is a bit puzzling. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Well, it, it's, it, it's basically back to the whole take rate product line take rate. So, so obviously, you know, the volume decrease on that would have been more than we would see on the boom screens, clearly. Um, there, you know, in our view, we don't see any discernible trend that's suggesting that there's a shift in permanent mix of products. It's just, it's just a, a function, effectively, of what type of project activity is in the marketplace. And, you know, obviously, the overall comparison versus prior year has been mostly impacted by weather issues. So if I've understood correctly, there isn't any particular factor driving this. It's just a random fluctuation. Let me, let me give you an example. Yeah, thank you. Customers work 100 or 200 miles from the house. You're a customer. Amazon's going to build five warehouses in your neighborhood this year. Are you going to buy large line or small line? You're going to buy large line. Next year, Amazon doesn't build any. But you've got a whole bunch of small jobs. You're going to go buy a small line machine and do small line jobs. It's job specific. And when you're only working in a very small territory, 
everything changes year in and year out. It's driven by the job, not by the customer wanting one side, one size or the other. Because a small one doesn't work on a large job. I mean, it works, but you're not going to be efficient. You're not going to, and, and the opposite's true. You're not going to bring a, a great big truck to a little tiny job. And take it. so it's job specific. It's hard to predict from one year to the next where that, where the, how the jobs are going to fall. We, we don't have to. We don't need to. I, we, you know, we, what we want to do is get the customer to buy something. And, and what we want him to be successful. And if a small line is going to make him successful, we'll sell him a small line. Large line is going to make him successful, we'll sell him a large line. So uh, moving to slide five on the financial summary, um, talked a good bit about the revenue, um, you know, the translation to EBITDA with some of the cost management. Uh, to defray the impact or to sort of mute the impact of the revenue decline. Uh, we still maintained a, an EBITDA margin of 29%, which is 300 basis points less than the prior period. Um, we feel we effectively balanced, as I mentioned, the investment in the in growth of the business with cost management. You know, the other profitability measures after tax are all on that down 20%, which is basically in line with, with kind of what you would expect uh, given the EBITDA performance. Um, the importantly, the cash flow from operations is still positive, solid cash flows. We did have some working capital uptick, about four million dollars of incremental investment in working capital, um, which is really driven by an, a, an increase of two million in inventory, two million in accounts receivable, uh, which is largely timing, uh, as as we had a little bit less volume than we would expect and timing of uh, trade trade deals. Um, overall, still a very positive cash position, comfortable for us at the mid year point. We generally our, our cash has a seasonality to it. Generally, the mid-year point is the low point of the year in terms of cash, and then there's the second half is a cash accumulation period. Um, but to note, the, the sort of decrease in cash from year end to, to June was largely div driven by the $14 million in dividends we paid, which was in April, sizable dividend payment, uh, on top of the $2 million acquisition of Line Dragon, which was a cash acquisition. Um, and you know, between the two, that really drove the decrease in cash. Um, and um, we talked about the interim dividend increase as well. Uh, so jumping to the operating results, um, one point to highlight uh, on this, the, the gross margin performance uh, down about 150 basis points versus the prior year. There were really three things that drove that. Uh, obviously, the decreased volume uh, caused some inefficiency uh, on our operations side of business. Um, that was one factor. The second factor, are the cost increases that we experienced from the uh, steel uh, import tariffs that were put in place at the second half of 2018 and really kind of basically got fully phased in in the beginning of 2019. Uh, and then we had a little bit of uh, geographic and regional impact on this. China margin pressure was a, a small piece of it, but that was in there as well. Um, so those three factors were on the downside. We did put through a price increase to recapture some of the cost increases we were experiencing, which was effective January 1st, and that offset some of the pressure. Um, one other thing to really note is it is a bit of an apples and oranges comparison because the tariffs and surcharges from our import costs on metal, steel, uh, were not in place in the first half of 18. Those did not really come online until mid-year. So it, it's sort of uh, a little bit of an unfair comparison in that regard. Importantly, though, from a gross margin perspective, we, we do view the current level of gross margin to be sustainable. Um, you know, we, we obviously look for some opportunity to improve our efficiency in the second half of, as activity improves. Um, and we feel comfortable that gross margins will remain stable with some modest upside opportunity. Um, and then we talked about operating expenses uh, and our tax rate remains uh, very stable in that 23-ish percent range, which is pretty much in line with the federal U.S. statutory rate plus some state and foreign tax on top of that. So on slide seven, the uh, financial position, um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the big decrease in cash period of, you know, from year end to June 30 was largely the $14 million dividend payment plus the $2 million uh, line dragon acquisition were the big drivers there. Uh, as I mentioned also previously, we had the $4 million in incremental uh, working capital. So the $2 million increase in accounts receivable, $2 million increase in inventory. You know, accounts receivable is really timing. Uh, we had a number of deals in the U.S. at the end of June. Uh, 
it occasionally happens where you, you have a lot of sales in the last part of the uh, month uh, that occurred in June. And those deals carry forward into the second half, but get resolved in the second half with collection. Um, on the inventory side, that's a function partly of the lower volume. So we had a build plan based on expectations for volume in the first half. Obviously, the volume came in less than we expected. So you have to work through that excess inventory as you progress through the year. But I would highlight that there is a structural increase to inventory from carrying the new Skyscreen uh, product family. That's about a half a million to a million of more, uh, I guess, recurring uplift in inventory to support that product line. Uh, moving to the cash flow statement, covered most of these points. Um, I would highlight one thing on this. Um, the, the net cash used in investing activities is reflective of the $2 million acquisition of Line Dragon. That's the majority of that number, the 2.7 million. Um, we are expecting to spend or, or to largely uh, complete and largely spend on the two capital uh, expansion projects uh, in Houghton, Michigan and Fort Myers in the second half. I mentioned the three and a half million for Houghton, Michigan and the half a million for the Fort Myers classroom expansion. That CapEx will largely be spent in the second half. Um, probably a quarter of it may bleed into next year as we finish off those projects. And just as a reminder, um, our run rate CapEx is about a million dollars to a million and a half, closer to a million run rate. And that's the CapEx required to support the business. We're not really a capital intensive business by any means. Um, and the good news for next year is that we don't have any significant cash outlay projects uh, on, on the horizon. So next year should be a relatively clean uh, cash spend year at this point in time. You know, in summary, the, the last thought I want to leave you with is um, <coughs> the most reliable information we've ever had about where things are going is from our customers. We're, we're direct sales and direct service around the world. Um, we have constantly talked to them about market conditions through the good times and through the bad. We have similar conversations. How's your business going? You're hiring people. What's your backlog? You know, what are your margins doing? You know, what are you seeing? That has been the best indicator for us all of the indications you've seen going forward and you know in the for you, any of you that lived through the last recession here you heard us talk in the same tones what was guiding us is what our customers told us and what i want you to leave with today is the realization that all of our customers are very very busy and they have large backlogs and I'll tell you another question that always indicates to us how sound the market is. A lot of these customers are second generation. Their families have been doing this for a long, long time. And they have fabulous instincts about when there's a shift in the market. And when we've had these conversations in the past, what happens when there's a shift in the market to a small businessman that when you get into bad times, and for most of them, especially in the winter, because due to the winter weather here and in the United States, their business slows down. They don't want to let their employees go when they don't have work, so they are funding the business out of their pocket. We went through eight years of recession in the United States in 12 years. A lot of these guys just barely made it. And as we've had discussions with them, the way we talk about that subject is, have you started building your pile? And in the construction language, the pile means the money pile big enough to get me through one of these that I just barely made it through before. The anecdote I'll give you is I just came back from an industry conference and I asked every single customer that was there how are things going? That whole litany of questions. My final one was, have you started to see any reason to build your pile? They kind of looked at me and laughed and said, Jack, you're a long ways off. So I, I realized that everybody's looking at the information we've put out here and looking back at our history. It's a very valid thing to do. Um, 
I, and I think it's a realistic thing to do. What I'm trying to say to you is today, this has no comparison to what we went through before. And yes, you know, has non-residential homes gone down? Yeah. This year it's only going to grow 2% and last year it grew 4% or something of that nature. Down does not mean a recession. Down means after doing this for eight years, the amount of growth would naturally slow down. That's not necessarily bad. What a lag period do you think there would be once this fog of uncertainty sort of disappears? Do you think it's going to be a six months or a 12 months? That's a, that's a great question. The real answer is we don't know because we've never seen this before. So we're, we're kind of surprised to find it out. I mean, we didn't have this information when we talked to you in June. As a matter of fact, we've just been digging up this information in the last few weeks because you're constantly looking at the market saying, something's not right here. You're going back to your, to your old base of knowledge and nothing is showing up there except what you hear the customers then saying. So I wish I could answer you, but I, I honestly don't know. I don't think any of us know. One, we don't know when it's going to end. <laughs> And I guess the only thing I would say is, and this is only natural for all of us, I think the longer it goes on, the more it starts to make us feel uncomfortable about the decisions we have to make. So we look for it to get over very quickly. Now, you guys are probably going to see that day sooner than we are, because our election isn't until a year from November. Uh, I have a question about um, dividend policy specifically. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with, with what I've heard today and, and based on the information you have from your customer customers, uh, you don't, my impression is you don't see a, a big cause for concern about the sales outlook. But th there's always a risk, as you say, which you cannot discount that, that the market w will turn down. Um, you, you have, I'm, I'm very happy that you have a very healthy balance sheet, good <laughs> cash balance. Um, in the event that there were a bit of a downturn for a period and the current dividend weren't fully covered, uh, would the board in principle be prepared to maintain the dividend at its current level uh, whilst it wasn't fully covered for, for a limited period? So, so when we put the dividend policy in place, we have two levels to it. So there's the 50% fixed payout ratio. And that, in our view, is sustainable through economic cycles. And we've stress tested it through our own modeling, et cetera. So we're, we're comfortable and confident that that 50% payout ratio is a, is a sustainable dividend. The supplemental dividend uh, policy that's layered on top is effectively a clearing mechanism for any excess cash that's on the balance sheet. So we don't hold an inefficient level of cash over and above what we need to, to run the business. So, you know, in a, in a um, you know, downturn scenario, we can't guarantee that there will be a supplemental, but we are confident we'd be able to maintain the 50% payout ratio. Uh, is that 50% of EPS or? It's 50% of uh, adjusted earnings after tax. Adjusted EPS. Adjusted EPS. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just wondering if you compared the business today to how it was in 2007, 2008, how might the business today, how, whether that from that storm versus how the business did then in terms of diversification, balance sheets, how are you looking different today than you, than you were then? So, um, so there's, there's one similarity which is very important and there's a few differences. So the similarity is that we're, we were variable cost, high variable cost back then and we're high variable cost today and that hasn't changed. So really we have a lot of levers to pull, primarily headcount management to, to manage our costs to keep it in line with the, the level of demand. The differences are that we're debt free, which is a big difference. We had, we had debt, uh, we had $20 million in debt coming out of the IPO in 2006 that we basically carried forward for a number of years. We've since paid that off completely, so we're in a positive net cash position. We are more diversified from a product basis. We have 14 products today. 
we had roughly two, I think two or three back then at the previous peak. So we have a lot more revenue streams coming in and we have more points of presence geographically across the globe. So we have more geographic diversity. So, you know, those reasons, for those reasons, we, we feel confident heading into any cycle whenever that does occur, just given the improved diversification and the strength of our financial position and our operating flexibility. Sorry, with, with the cash that you've got, are you ever looking at companies or products that you might be able to buy into the family, as it were, so that you give yourself a little bit more of a spread in all weathers? So maybe something that's indoors or something that, you know, just can be used, you know, and you can sell to the market in a way that you'll not have quite as much volatility over the year? Sure. No, I, I can say we look all the time at different opportunities that would fit, but we've been very disciplined historically to, to stick to our core business, our core customer base, you know, what fits within our, our sort of market. Um, and there's been very limited opportunities for that, uh, for any differentiated product or service. We're not interested in acquiring a commodity that can be replicated that doesn't add a, a lot of value to our customers. So, um, you know, we did have the Line Dragon acquisition last year, which was opportunistic for us, and it was a, a nice tuck in. Um, but generally speaking, it's very difficult to find those opportunities. And we're also very conscious to not create a whole new business that would require separate infrastructure, separate channel, um, that doesn't really fit well within our competencies. So um, we'll continue to look, but it, it's really not, m has really not been an op, um, a lever of growth for us uh, over the years. Can, can you quantify your market share today across your different products globally? Well, the best way to look at market share, I mean, we have a couple of competitors out there. So you, you typically measure market share by what percentage of the total market do you have. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we have 99% of the market share of everything that's screeded mechanically with laser screeds. We tend to look at it differently because there's segments of the markets out there that are still done manually. So we look at the manual part and we look at our penetration into a different market. And within the markets, if you think about each machine as being a different market segment, in other words, the big machine does big slabs. That varies by countries. So the simple answer I can give you that just to show your perspective, if you take all large slabs in the UK and in the United States, 100% of them are done with our machines. Now, as you go down into smaller slabs, we've had specific machines made to do smaller slabs. So depending on when you introduce that machine, and I'll be a little extreme here, if we just introduced the new machine yesterday, we would have zero penetration in the market. So as time goes on, your penetration increases. So the answer to your question, it's a good question, and I understand it, is that it depends upon what products we've introduced lately and to what markets we've introduced them in. But broadly, there's a lot of opportunity worldwide for us to continue to penetrate with the products we've got on top of getting the trade-ins for the upgrades we make, the new models we make. As John mentioned, very similar to getting a car. All right, thank you for your interest and your support. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.